moved to those of you on the east and west coasts. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Ethan Marcus. So good to have you here for part two of a one of three part series on Sephardic rights versus responsibilities. What is the proper path a person should choose? We're very happy here to have our dear friend and community member, uh, Rabbi Devin Maimon Vero Real, a graduate of Yeshivat Chovevei Torah, an educational leader uh, and consultant uh, for the Sephardic community, including at the Sephardic Educational Center and the Sephardic Adventure Camp, as well as longtime um, um, uh, teacher and educator across the United States, including Los Angeles and Seattle, among other places. Just as a reminder, these programs are all through a wonderful Sephardic Digital Academy, a host of different educational courses on Torah, Halakha, Ladino language, Sephardic cooking, Sephardic culture, and so much more. If you're interested in learning more about our other classes, please check out our website at SephardicBrotherhood.com. Now, without further ado, I'm going to head over the floor to our amazing educator today, Rabbi Devin. Rabbi Bechavod. Thank you so much, Ethan, and uh, thanks everybody for joining together for some learning uh, this afternoon and evening, uh, and a special thank you to the Ermandad, uh, to the Sephardic Jewish Brotherhood, uh, for this wonderful platform to be able to do this learning together. We are immersed, and we're going to talk more about this, obviously, in this topic of individual rights versus communal responsibility. It's a very rich tension um, that is really something that, again, we see playing out in so many arenas, um, be they uh, political, economic, et cetera. But really, in any communal uh, reality, right, there is this push and pull. And so having a sense about how to navigate that is something that is uh, um, really important, uh, something to approach with wisdom, um, and not merely just sort of like our natural leanings. Um, and uh, thankfully, we have some really great examples from our hachamim, uh, about how to navigate that exactly. Um, and we'll delve into some more of their words uh, as we did last week uh, today. Uh, but before we do, I always like to open up the floor in the uh, to offer an invitation for people to uh, share any uh, dedication, something that they would dedicate, like to dedicate our learning to this evening, be it somebody's birthday or a milestone uh, that you're experiencing, or just a hope or positive message you want to put out there, um, or anything of note, truthfully, um, in your life that you would like to dedicate our learning to this evening. So I'll give people just a moment uh, to go ahead and put uh, their dedication into the chat. Uh, again, uh, anything of note that you'd like to dedicate our learning to this evening, please feel free to put in the chat at this moment. Okay, people should feel free if at any point they'd like to put into the chat um, uh, something that they would like to dedicate the learning to. It's never too late. Feel free to do that. Uh, we see here, though, to the growth of our Sephardic community, amen, uh, in, in many ways, and uh, to remembering a Memorial Day, which just passed yesterday, and of course, all of the uh, men and women who have given their lives for the uh, freedom of our country. Um, and uh, so we hold those in mind as we dive into our learning uh, for today. Uh, as I mentioned last time, um, we kind of all have uh, our natural leanings, right? Um, and they're good to be aware of just to kind of think about where our starting point is um, and, you know, kind of see how this learning, you know, either strengthens kind of what we think or maybe it challenges us, maybe it nuances it. Um, but I do want to, like last time, we sort of did a poll, right, to kind of see where, where people were at. But uh, I invite people to just sort of call to mind again, like, where is your natural leaning uh, in terms of really feeling like what has the stronger pull for you when thinking about decisions? Is it uh, individual rights or is it uh, communal responsibility? Um, and just to kind of hold that uh, again in mind as we delve into our learning today, um, I also note a, um, 
another dedication in the chat for Rifu Ashulei Ma. Uh, so thank you very much for for mentioning that. The whole Chole Amu Yisrael. So thank you very much. Um, Again, I want to remind people here in the chat the sort of like the enduring understandings right of these sessions uh, that we're uh, engaging in um, are the following that Judaism recognizes that human beings have inalienable rights. And Judaism recognizes that human beings have inescapable responsibilities. Sephardic sages incorporate the recognition of these concepts into their understanding of Jewish law, halakha, and philosophy. Their decisions provide a framework from which we can learn about how we might approach a balance between rights and responsibilities in a way that allows communities and their members to thrive. Um, and so just a, a quick recap um, from last time that we really talked about um, Sephardic Hakamim demonstrating a balance between uh, individual rights and communal responsibility in particular, a, a way where they showed us that they actually don't have to be in opposition, right? I, I actually set this conversation up as, you know, as a tension, and, and it is to some degree. Uh, but actually, what we saw last week was a really beautiful example of how um, following right, the pull of, for example, individual rights can help us redefine what it means to be a member of a community um, in a way that benefits the whole community. We saw that uh, in the response uh, regarding the Saris Chama, the eunuch and serving as a Shaliach Tzibor um, from Rabbi Avram Chaim Rodriguez of Livorno, Italy. Um, and we also saw how coming down on the side very strongly of communal responsibility can actually be done in a way that uh, invests in and sees the value in, in communities investing in their individuals. As we saw uh, from the response of Mincha Techad from Rabbi Shabtai of Salonika, Greece, uh, where he talked about um, individuals who have chidushim into the Torah, novel insights into the Torah, how they have the communal responsibility to share those. But again, built on the assumption actually that we are providing the educational opportunities for individuals for them to do that. So that was the example that we saw last time where they don't actually have to be in opposition to one another, but actually they can be mutually supportive. Um, today, we're gonna kind of take a different tact. Today, we'll be looking at the balance between individual rights and communal responsibility as reflected in the authority that each one has. Again, we will look to response to literature for our examples. Today's cases come from a very special pair of rabbis, actually. Uh, they were the very first rabbis in the Americas. We're going to be looking at a writing from Rabbi Yitzchak Abo Abda Fonseca and another from Rabbi Moshe Rafael de Aguilar, who were rabbinic leaders in the middle of the 17th century in the Recife and Mauricia, Brazil, respectively. These were the first Jewish communities of the Americas. Uh, they were largely uh, Portuguese Jews that had uh, settled in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, uh, and come to Recife, Brazil, and then uh, Mauricia um, uh, as part of that European uh, colony. Um, and that is actually when that group had to leave when Portugal retook Brazil um, and groups who had to go back, groups of Jews needed to go back to the Netherlands. That was uh, included a group of 23 Jews that um, were detoured due to pirates and all sorts of other things that landed them in New Amsterdam. And that actually became the first Jewish community of North America. Um, and so we're going to be looking at uh, the writings of their rabbinic leaders today. Uh, so kind of a, a special um, opportunity in terms of thinking about American Jewish history. Uh, so I'm going to put into the chat right now a link to a Google document, um, which everybody who is participating this evening is uh, shared on uh, as a commenter. And so there's going to be some opportunities for people to comment um, on the document um, just to kind of get some conversation going. Um, so I'm going to show everybody how to do that in a minute, uh, and then we'll get into the study itself. Um, I'm going to share my screen. So when you click that link that's in the chat, it'll take you to this document. Uh, and what you'll be able to do uh, as we get to the relevant parts of the text is that you can do the following. Uh, some of you may know how to do this already, but if this is a, a new practice for you, uh, here's how you do this. So for example, if you are looking at the text together when we're reading it and you notice something about the usage of the word truth, you just click there, you can highlight it, 
uh, you'll click on this button here, which opens up the comments. You'll click on this one, which has a plus, and that allows you to insert your comments. Um, again, if you see truth, you can actually just click at the end of the word, click on this comment box, go to the plus, and you can put in your comment there. So there will be some, some opportunities to have some conversation that way. Um, okay, and so without further ado, let's get into looking at the balance of individual rights and communal responsibility by looking at the authority that each one has in these rabbinic decisions. Um, so let's take a look first with Rabbi Yitzchak Aboab da Fonseca. Again, 17th century, he was born in Portugal. He actually lived the first few years of his life as a Catholic, uh, but um, was is, uh, one of those of the converso community by practicing Judaism in the home. Uh, and then his family escapes to the Netherlands in order to practice Judaism freely. Um, so he, when he became older, was one of the most important hachamim of Amsterdam and of the community in Recife, Brazil. So he was asked about the validity of a particular proclamation of the ban, or a cherem, in the community. Um, the Spanish and Portuguese Jews were quite famous, or perhaps notorious, for their usage of cherem. Um, people familiar with Spinoza, for example, um, uh, know very well about the power, uh, potential power of cherem, of putting someone under ban. But that was a really extreme example. Um, people were put in cherem for all kinds of reasons. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, that they said something disparaging about uh, one of the rabbis or one of the members of the Ma'amad, uh, the council that ran the community, and they would be put in the ban for that. Um, and that included, uh, basically, people could not patronize their businesses, people in the community could not talk to them, um, they were not permitted their seats in the synagogue. Uh, it was pretty rough, um, and it would last for any period of time uh, until the person repented of their behavior. Um, sometimes it was actually, you know, a, a very effective tool for misbehavior. Sometimes people genuinely were out there misbehaving, and the cherem was a way uh, that the community sort of um, brought these uh, people to, to, to change and, or correct their behavior. Um, and so here is a question where somebody was put under the ban, uh, and there are those who feel like it isn't, it wasn't right for the, for the rabbis to put this person under cherem. Um, and so they asked this question uh, about the validity of this particular instance of using cherem. Um, and in his response, Rabbi de Fonseca explores the nature of authority in communal matters, particularly the authority of rabbis and its relationship to the communities they lead. Um, so we're actually going to um, start off actually, uh, though, with like a broader question. Uh, and that is sort of this, this, again, this question really poses, well, where does... Um, rabbinic authority really come from? And so I just want to kind of put out there as a question for us, what are some of the things that we've heard, right, um, in terms of like, where do rabbis get their authority from? And if we can just sort of put that in the chat, um, that we can kind of just get a sense of what, what are some of the ideas out there of where do, like, where do rabbis get their authority from? So if you want to just take a moment again to put that into the chat, and I'm actually going to stop sharing for a minute, so I can put that prompt in. So what have we heard are possible sources of rabbinic authority? Where do rabbis get their authority from? And people can either unmute or they can pop their response into the chat, please. Okay, great. So we have, when Jews were not considered citizens, right, of the larger countries they were part of, rabbis had to make rulings, right? So really it is, you know, like a municipality, right? It needs governance. So it really comes from... Uh, if I'm understanding the comment correctly, um, that it is uh, really coming from the need to have a communal organization. Okay, communal acceptance and consent, right? In other words, uh, rabbis have as much power as the people give to them. Excellent. Anybody else? Okay, their years of education and recognized rabbinical schools, right? In that way, it is kind of like um, degree granting, right? Uh, institutions uh, where they uh, basically say this person has qualified, right, in order to have this level of authority. And so we grant them that. 
Uh, and that would be an example like we see here in the chat. Thank you for that response. Um, that's another great insight right, that really comes from their training and expertise. So if people have a thought, they again should continue to, ah, here we go. The state empowered them with authority, the millet system and the Ottoman empire. And actually that could be like the whole topic of a, of a class unto itself, right? So it is actually um, possibly authority granted by the larger government um, and basically having, you know, smaller communities that govern themselves with the permission, right? Uh, of, an, uh, of a larger umbrella government, for example, like the Ottoman empire. Great, so we have that, we have this idea of being vested with authority through um, training uh, and education and expertise. Um, we also have the idea of basically it is the people that give uh, authority to the rabbinic leaders. Um, and also, um, it is, again, is sort of actually a matter of communal organization, right? Jews are not citizens, right? Um, and we're not for a long time, right? Uh, so in this context, right, there not necessarily citizens in the full way, right, that, uh, that others are, and uh, so didn't necessarily have the same relationship to the law. Uh, and so rabbis are there actually to create a governance structure. So those are all possibilities. And we're gonna look, uh, and actually I really appreciate the diversity of answers here because it, it shows us actually that um, there's a lot of different ways to look at this. And so what we're gonna see from Rabbi De Fonseca is a choice. Right, not, not a choice like oh, like you know, I choose this one. But he had options of how he could have understood this, and this is what he felt was the most compelling. Um, and as you can see on this document, and I'm going to reshare right now, uh, that he really actually uh, leads us down the path of the consent of the governed. Um, although it's not the quite the the consent of the governed that uh, many of us are familiar with um, in the, uh, for example, Declaration of Independence. Uh, the American Declaration of Independence, but it's actually a great place to start. Uh, so let's take a look here. The consent of the governed, uh, this is the quote now from the American Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Basically, people have rights, and the government is only there to really ensure that those rights are protected. Um, and it is by the consent of the governed that governments uh, do that. Um, and that is where their authority comes from. That whenever any form a government becomes destructive of the, these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Um, and then it goes on to talk about uh, with great trepidation actually, right? Do they actually uh, sever their ties with England? It's not a step that they took lightly, uh, but we do see this sense of the consent of the governed. What's really interesting is that this idea, right, though put, you know, uh, to a parchment, right, and in, in the American Declaration of Independence in 1776, these ideas had been around for more than 100 years at this point. Um, people like John Milton um, wrote about this idea, uh, people like John Locke, um, who is probably the most influential for the American founding fathers, um, of having natural rights, and that the government is there to secure those. And so the government really only exists by the consent of the governed. And so we're going to hold this in our minds because uh, we're going to see that Rabbi De Fonseca was certainly familiar with these ideas, but puts a beautiful Jewish twist on it. Uh, and so I want us to have that in mind uh, as we read this. And of course, we'll then come back to, well, and what does all this have to do with individual rights and communal responsibility? Um, so let's go ahead and dive into the text now. So this is on authority of a ban placed by the community and regarding those who trespass communal agreements. Um, for those of you that are interested in the Hebrew, you can take a look at it here. Um, it's actually a part of a longer essay, but this is sort of the most relevant excerpt for us today. So Rabbi De Fonseca writes, our sages have already informed us. The end of the action is the first in the thought, right, from uh, it says, as I approach this sacred matter, it is upon me to explain first the purpose of this statement. 
which is to refute the position of those who are stirring people up and to protect those affected by them. Regarding a ban, cherem, issued in this community, which is accepted by four sages, hachamim, with the agreement of the whole community, no one has the ability to nullify or release it. And for any who trespass it, there is nothing to prevent his falling under the ban as well, unless that same community or one similar to it in numbers decides to release or undo that cherem. Basically, if you don't abide by the rules of the cherem, you too fall under cherem, um, and really nobody else can undo that, although technically right, another community could, but he goes on, and though it is within their rights to do it, it may not be the right thing to do. Firstly, because it may compromise the unity and thriving of the community and the needs of its impoverished. So we have a little bit of a hint here that this may have had to do something to, uh, with something pertaining to giving of tzedakah um, and somebody not abiding by that, and so uh, thereby um, falling under cherem. But now let's get to the sort of the crux of the matter. So he says, for it is only in it, unity, a peaceful unity, right, that God makes God's presence to reside upon us. Such is the truth that our sages expressed in the Midrash on the words of the prophet Hosea. Ephraim is addicted to idols, let him be. Rabbi says, great is peace, for even when Israel worshipped idols but had peace amongst them, it was as if the omnipresent said, I have no power over them, since peace is amongst them. As it was said, Ephraim is addicted to, literally connected through, or united through idols, let him be. But once they were divided, what does the prophet go on to say? Now that his bows are broken up, or his heart is divided, he feels his guilt. From this you learn the greatness of peace and the wretchedness of divisiveness. When peace is amongst the people, there is no power that can prevail against them, and no judgment that can find them guilty. However, when they become divisive, there is certainly judgment against them, and it is fitting that it should be exacted from them. Um, so we're going to just pause right here. Um, we're going to, uh, he really kind of lays out his argument in the next paragraph. But just up until this point, if people can use the commenting function um, uh, again and um, just mark something that stands out to them, what surprises them, what's interesting to them, what stands out to them in these first two paragraphs. And again, you can do, for example, this. I'll, 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 I'm going to do one myself. Um, then people can do the same. So you can highlight here, click here, and just add your comment. All right, so people can take a minute. I'll give us just a few minutes here and people should uh, comment. If you need uh, a reminder of how to do it, you can feel free to uh, send me a message in the chat and I'm happy to walk you through it. All right, in addition to the comments that might be going in, we also have in the chat here. So when people are getting along, they don't need authority as when there is conflict. Well said. OK, 
in here, right? It also seems ironic to me that Torah tells us to seek unity and peace among the Jewish people, yet we constantly fight amongst ourselves. Torah knows that we, in many ways, can be our own worst enemies. Well stated. Uh, a mentor of mine, uh, who many people know here, Rabbi Daniel Buskila, often says that you can tell what a community struggles with the most by what they talk about the most as their virtue. Uh, so achdut, right, is a uh, thing that we talk about a lot, unity, uh, but it is definitely one of our biggest challenges for sure as well. Uh, Ethan, when you were typing in, it was actually had you originally as anonymous moose. So I was kind of hoping that actually it would, it would list you as anonymous moose. Okay, great. Um, as always, if people have thoughts afterwards, please feel free to put them in. Um, so we've got a few things going on here, right? Um, I was fascinated by, you know, that God says, I actually can't do anything, right? I, I, you know, people are getting along. That's like, you know, I can't interfere with that, which is really quite uh, striking. Uh, other people have talked about sort of the need, right, for authority might really just be when people can't get along, but when they can, right, perhaps they don't need authority. Um, and also, again, this, this talk, uh, how much talk we have of unity really reflecting uh, what we struggle with. Um, so keeping all of that in mind, we're going to go now to uh, Rabbi Defonseca's uh, full response here um, and his approach to the consent of the government. So he says, there are also those who come with the claim that the ban in question did not take effect and was not put in place by a sage, a chacham. Right? He says that basically there was no rabbinic person that issued this ban, and so therefore it's not a valid ban. He says, I dispute this. There were certainly four sages. There were four chachamim, right, there, who were also signatories. He said, furthermore, the response to those making this claim is in their own words, because in fact, the community as a community can issue a ban without the agreement of a sage. The definitive proof of this comes from what is written regarding Shaul, when he was praying that God would send them victory in battle, and he commanded that anyone who ate on that day would be put under the ban. See Sefer Shemuel Aleph, chapter 14, fascinating episode. Therefore, Jonathan, his son, who had not heard about the cherem, dipped his staff in a beehive of honey and tasted it, hardly even considered e eating, but nevertheless, the lot fell to him, and his father judged according to the law in declaring, quote, Jonathan shall surely be put to death. However, the people redeemed him, right? The community, right? The king has given an order, and the people say, no, we're actually not going to follow that order. Did they redeem Jonathan with money? No, rather they redeemed him with the power of community, which has been given to them. Logic dictates the same. For it is not a king that chooses his people, but a people that chooses its king. By the way, people should appreciate in the 17th century, this was like a line, right? This, is, this was like a very uh, well-known phrase in political philosophy. Now, it is not a king that chooses his people, but a people that chooses its king. So also did Shalomo Solomon teach, in the multitude of people is the glory of the king. Barov Am Hadrat Melech. In any case, we see that the power of the community is even greater than the power of the king when they walk in the light of the laws of the Torah. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, take a look here. Um, and if people can, uh, just try to identify, right? And people should, you know, go back to the text and kind of look around a little bit. But where do we see any incidents of um, Rabbi Defonseca alluding to the consent of the governed? And if people can either just put a quote from the text that they see in the chat, or again, if they want to highlight in the text itself, um, you know, and just put a note, right? The, here we see consent of the governed. Uh, but if people can, again, look at the text, and where do we see Rabbi da Fonseca making an appeal uh, to this idea of the consent of the governed?
Great, so we see one example, the community as a community can issue a ban without agreement of a sage. Great. Others find any textual evidence for where Rabbi Dafon Seca notes consent of the governed. Great, also people redeemed him. Great, I'm gonna highlight a couple myself as well. And I've seen some things uh, in the chat, right? Uh, great. Where people mentioned the power of the community, that phrase, excellent. And I see a question here as well. Uh, I see two comments actually I want to highlight and then we'll uh, move forward. Uh, someone said, so as a retired educator, we want students to get along uh, so that there is minimal interference by the teacher, right? We teach them to be independent, beautiful, right? That might actually be the end sort of end game for, for God, right? Or, you know, sort of like uh, eventually such a good job is done instructing the people that they can sort of, you know, uh, not be as directly involved, right? Uh, beautiful. And certainly the case, right, uh, I think, uh, a model for rabbis to consider as well, right? It's a beautiful model of educating people um, uh, to the point where, again, uh, they're able to have this level of independence. Somebody asked a question, what authority was considered both learned and ejective enough, like Moses, to render a fair decision? Such a good question. And actually, it kind of strikes at the heart of this. Um, I mean, in some ways, right, it's this interesting balance between, you know, they had to be given that um, invested with that authority, um, you know, by uh, communally recognized institutions, right? The, the great one um, in Amsterdam was Eitz Chaim. Um, but also, right, what Rabbi De Fonseca would seem to argue is that basically the people have to accept them as such. Um, and if they don't, uh, then that is somebody that would not be considered then a valid uh, judge, right, who could render a fair decision. So it's this interesting kind of um, combination of having the authority from institutions as well as having the community uh, recognize them. Um, so that's a great question and kind of gets right to the heart of the matter. Okay, so um, we are going to uh, take a look at a couple of other questions. So what we see is we see the consent of the governed, but what we also should be noticing is that it is not um, the same consent of the governed, though, as we see in, for example, the um, American Declaration of Independence, which really sort of has the consent of the governed being based on certain natural rights. Uh, Rabbi De Fonseca has a, a, a different source for that. What is the source, basically, um, for the community, right, uh, to give their consent uh, to be um, led by particular rabbis in their community to have certain decisions be effective, even in the case of uh, Shaul, right, even for the king, right? Um, where does the their power to do that come from? There's this beautiful line um, where uh, a Rabbi Da Fonseca says, they redeemed him with the power of community which has been given to them, but where did that come from? Uh, and so again, we have to look back at the text, but does anybody, anybody have any uh, sense of where their power comes from? Right, it was given to them, but who gave them their, that power? So let's go ahead and take a look and see if anybody has any possible uh, thoughts. And again, you can put that in the chat or feel free to unmute to share uh, any hypotheses.
So there's really kind of two possibilities I want to put out there for people. Um, and it's not so clear from Rabbi Dafonseca himself um, which one exactly he intends, but he really in the text makes reference to two. Um, so the first one actually people have already mentioned. Uh, and that is in essence the, uh, the standard of peace and unity. In essence, the people are the ones that determine whether or not there is peace and unity. And so therefore that is what gives them the authority to say, listen, this leader is either helping us create this or they're not. Um, and based on that, we will accept this person as an authority or not. So one seems to be uh, the presence of unity and peace. That is the standard that the community decides. And that seems to be the, the their sort of natural right, right? In the same way that in the American Declaration of Independence, you had life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, here, it seems to be unity and peace. That that is the uh, leader's job, right? The authority's job to help protect and procure. And it's the community that decides ultimately whether or not that is being done for them. Um, and that seems to be one source of their authority. Uh, their sort of power of community. The second is in this last line that he mentions, um, where he says, in any case, we can see that the power of the community is even greater than the power of the king when they walk in the light of the laws of the Torah. So it would seem to be that it is the Torah itself that grants authority first and foremost to the community, and provided that they are walking in the light of the lies of the Torah, they have that ability uh, to designate who leads them and who serves as an authority in their community. So uh, we'll take a look now at this last question, just as kind of way of summing up this one, because what does this then have to do with individual rights and communal responsibilities? Um, and the way that we can think about that is when we look at this, um, from the perspective of Rabbi Deflonseca, what is it that is the heavier value when we take a look at this? Is it ultimately about individual rights or is it about communal responsibility? What makes um, a leader, what makes a rabbinic authority an authority? Is it how they relate to individual rights or is it how they relate to communal responsibility? So people can just take a moment to put into the chat what they think. And you can actually kind of argue this both ways, although I have a, I do have a take on this. Um, and so there isn't a, a wrong answer here. But if people can put in what they think Rabbi Defonseca is arguing, that is uh, ultimately the consent of the governed issue coming down on the side of the greater value of communal responsibility or of individual rights. And if people can just take a moment to put that into the chat when they're ready. I'm gonna stop my screen share for a moment so we can, can go to the chat for a minute. Okay, great, so we have here, when an individual has been wronged, the need a community, they need a community to support them to resolve the problem. Excellent. Okay, so the Torah itself is the ultimate root of all authority. It delineates where the community should slash needs to rule versus the learned judges, teachers of the community. 
All right, so uh, I think you know this really goes back to that final sentence uh, in Rabbi De Fonseca talking about really the Torah being the arbiter, right, uh, of what authority is, um, and it does right delineate what the community needs to do, um, and fundamentally, then the the learned judges and teachers of the community uh, play that role to support that. So I don't know if I'm if I'm reading your comment right, so you can tell me if I if I'm not, uh, but that would really seem to revolve largely around the community. And so it seems to be sort of like that here, right, in terms of whether or not something is an authority really has to do with its effect on the community and the quality of communal responsibility that is happening. So for the sake of time, that's where I'm going to pause here. What we see with Rabbi De Fonseca is that largely when we look at the authority and whether or not a, a decision from a rabbi, right, is, has authority, has mostly to do with whether or not it upholds that communal standard of creating peace and unity. And that's not something that is particularly, um, that happens on the level of the individual. It happens on the level of the community. And so that seems to be where he is placing his emphasis. That fundamentally, when we think about leaders and how um, they make their decisions and the authority that they have, it stems from the communal responsibility component. It stems from the quality of communal responsibility that is happening, and that determines whether or not this person has authority. So here we're gonna take a pause and change directions because what we're left with in that case, right? If it comes down to, listen, as long as people are getting along, is that what it's all about? Does that sort of mean that that's a good decision and that that is a good uh, leader, right? That has rendered it. Um, we could say it this way. Uh, the authority of rabbis, and it even seems of God's presence, right, from that first part, appears to be bounded by a responsibility to the community to ensure and protect some kind of moral peace and cooperation. This power of community stems from the code of the Torah itself, whose entire being, according to one famous Talmudic passage, is to ensure darche shalom, the ways of peace. But is that it? As long as a halakha, as interpreted by rabbinic authority, ensures peace, is it authoritative? The next case raises the role of individual rights in rabbinic authority. Because as famously, um, as some people may know, there was a term Pax Romana, right? Rome also had a great deal of peace, but they also trampled all over people's rights in order to ensure that peace. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, is peace really enough? Is that communal level enough? And this next case that we're going to look at is going to raise that other side of it, namely the role of individual rights in the authority uh, of a decision of a rabbinic figure of a leader. So let's take a look at that now. I'm going to share my screen once more. Oh, somebody put something um, in the comment that uh, I want to raise, right? The compact, right? A covenant between God and all the Jewish people, including the leaders, as recorded in the Torah, is in stark contrast to mob rule with all its prejudices and violence. That's really excellent, right? It isn't just sort of like um, the demos, right? Like the um, sort of the, um, the, the not great parts of sort of, you know, the majority rules, right? There's something really important about majority rules, but there's also something that potentially has... Uh, uh, has the potential for mob rule. And so the Torah really restrains that, right? Uh, and I think that I, I love this comment because uh, it really gets to that point that uh, Rabbi Da Fonseca raises of the community has this authority when they walk in the light of the laws of the Torah, right? So it's not a, 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 a sort of blank check, right? Authority of the majority in the community, uh, but it only comes from their abiding by the, the laws of the Torah. So thank you for raising that. Um, so again, I'm going to raise my uh, uh, share my screen here to look at the next decision. So um, this is a really fascinating case. This was again Rabbi Da Fonseca's sort of right hand man, uh, Rabbi uh, Moshe Rafael de Aguilar. Um, and basically, there was a question that came to the Beit Din in Recife. This is when they were in Brazil about uh, treating tobacco. This was a huge industry for the Jews in the area in the mid 1600s. Treating and uh, basically doing what needed to be done, working to produce tobacco on Chol Hamoed, right? The middle days of the festivals like Pesach uh, and Sukkot. Um, 
And basically, Rabbi De Fonseca said that it is forbidden. He just gave the blanket um, rule that it was forbidden. Um, and what we have is this response uh, from Rabbi De Aguilar, um, who challenges that. And how he does it is quite fascinating. And again, it puts into sharp relief the role of individual rights. OK, so in our case, despite the permissions for doing so, it is possible to advise the prohibition of the treating of tobacco in any manner on Chol HaMo'ayim. For if we don't, people may come to do it in a way that is not permitted. That is, when the case spoken of is not one of something irretrievably lost or destroyed. In Halakha, we call that Davar Ha'aved, right? really only supposed to do work on Chol HaMo'ayim that is not retrievable, right? Uh, that would be lost or ruined, right? If one waited until after the, the holiday or when there is not an issue of losing clients, which will cause the loss of his capital, or when the workers are not poor. Um, especially considering that sometimes a person's motivation for doing such work is to damage his fellow and to take away his customers, or to wait until Chol HaMoed specifically to work. The intention of prohibiting is completely reasonable in these cases. So he says, first, first of all, again, from a communal level, it actually makes sense. He says, I get it. This is, if we just outright prohibit this work, we're gonna make sure that people are not doing it improperly. We're gonna make sure that people are not trying to undermine one another's business. Um, we are going to, on a communal level, achieve a certain amount of peace and cooperation through doing this. On the other hand, he says, it seems that such a measure is quite sharp and harsh. To tie the hands of a person who is watching his business spoil, as no one may treat it, the tobacco, as is necessary, having been forbidden, even though it is something which in and of itself is permitted. And particularly considering that enacting this rule works especially against the poor. The main point is that in this area in which halakha and our sages themselves have permitted based on righteousness, tzedakah, and generosity of heart, in the divut lev, will we come along now and prohibit something which has never been made so before in this holy community? It would be better, in my humble opinion, to order and announce that from here on, no person can work in the aforementioned tobacco factories during Chol HaMoed without the express permission of the Chacham Moreno Verabeno, and he's talking about Rabbi Da Fonseca, who will thoroughly look into the causes requiring the work. And if they should be appropriate, he shall permit it. And if not, he shall forbid it. And all who are so brazen as to work without this permission, they will be punished or fined as is seen fit by the Chacham, his venerable honor. And so really what we have here is an attempt by Rabbi De Fonseca to say, here's the communal rule. It will ensure peace and cooperation. And Rabbi De Aguilar is saying, you actually can't issue that ruling. That isn't enough. You can't issue a ruling blanketly across the community. You have to take this one on a case-to-case -case basis, because there are individual rights here that if we are, if we just go with the communal ruling, will be tread upon. And so you have to do this individual by individual. We cannot have a blanket communal policy. So just to start off, I want to ask us the question, Right. The American Declaration of Independence states that among the inalienable rights that all people have are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I want to ask us, what inalienable rights does Rabbi the Aguilar imply people have that can't be tread upon here? So again, let's take a look. And in particular, uh, if you just see in this bottom paragraph, um, we can take a look really just in this first section. What appears to be the, inalien the inalienable right that Rabbi the Aguilar says, listen, actually, you can't make this communal rule. It actually trespasses on, on certain indiv uh, individual rights. And so you've got to take this on a case-to-case -case basis. So what does he seem to be describing here? And again, people can either put that in the chat, or if they want to put it in the comment, or they can uh, also feel free to unmute. I'm going to stop my share for a moment so we can go to the chat in a fuller way. Okay, so we have the possibility of individual livelihoods. 
So I think that that is exactly it. Um, it seems to be that um, there is a very serious taking uh, of issue with this idea that we would prevent people from making a livelihood. Um, and again, it, what's fascinating about these uh, writings is that on the one hand, they're great insight because they are all in the language of Jewish law, right? That's what the great thing about using responsa. The challenging thing about them is that they're not treatises, right, on political philosophy. So a lot of that is implied. So it would seem here, though, that people have an inalienable right to a livelihood. Um, and that on the one hand, obviously, that has to be balanced with, uh, with halakha, within the parameters of halakha. Um, but within that, right, to make a sweeping um, pronouncement, right, that this cannot be done on cholam oed, even though there's a halakhic way to allow it, um, to not take that and to harm then somebody's ability to make a living um, seems to be too far. Um, and so that pushes um, uh, Rabbi de Aguilar to say, you can't make just a blanket communal statement, even if it creates a peaceful cooperation, right, you actually have to look at this case by case because there's an individual right here that has to be addressed. Um, I think there's a couple of other possibilities as well, uh, although I think that, that one is very strong. Um, so anybody else want to think about what the possibility is uh, of what the individual right um, is uh, that is uh, being uh, considered here? Okay, free will, freedom of choice, potentially even one's privacy. So I think that that actually it does connect to, to one of these ideas. Um, and that is that we saw, for example, um, um, that halakha actually does permit doing this kind of work, right, on uh, on Chol HaMoed. At least there is an argument to permit it. And so in some ways, it is that freedom of choice. Listen, I know that there exists in halakha, right, um, a permission to do this. So I have a certain freedom of choice to be able to, uh, to avail myself of that. Again, I think it's not totally separate from the freedom to make a, a living. Um, that seems to be connected to it. But there also seems to be this idea that if there is a halakhic permissibility, then I, and there's also a, a way to uh, prohibit it as well. But nevertheless, I have a certain freedom of choice, uh, given that there is that range. So I think that those are the two that are kind of really operative. So it's really fascinating to look at that play out we're even in a situation where there is a communal situation that is created uh, through the prohibition of something, um, where it creates that first standard of communal cooperation and there's peace. Um, nevertheless, when there is an individual right to be addressed, right, there seems to be from this sage a real um, compulsion to, to make sure that that is dealt with. Okay, so let me uh, wrap up this session for today with the following. So, what we saw was here again a rabbinic authority being bounded, this time by a claim to uh, individual rights, something akin to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is relevant because on some level, the original decision checks the first box, right? This one dealing with the cherem, right? Um, the, oh, I'm sorry, the, the first one to prohibit, right? Uh, producing tobacco on Holom away. That checks the first box that we talked about of creating peace and cooperation. But still here we see certain aspects of individual rights that have to be protected. Similarly, we see that they have to be approached by receiving permission from the Chacham, whose authority derives from creating an appropriate communal outcome of peace and cooperation. So even in that individual case, we cannot let go of that larger communal standard. Taken together, we see a balance between individual rights and communal responsibility that is manifested by the push and the pull they exert on halakhic decisions that impact both. In particular, what we see from these Sephardic sages is a pattern in which halakhic policies are crafted based on communal needs first. I think it's an interesting thing that comes out of this. Is that a, a, a sort of universal, universal statement? No, but it is certainly what we see coming from these examples. Right, that first um, halakhic policies are crafted based on communal needs, an important point in and of itself. But then there must be, there must remain a responsiveness to situations in which individual rights might be violated. And then that policy and those decision makers must be prepared to adjust accordingly. It's relevant actually that we talk about this. Uh, we see exactly this kind of thing happen in last week's parasha, 
right? We have a communal standard for Pesach, but then you have the individuals that said that we couldn't participate in Pesach. We were burying our dead or we were involved in another mitzvah. Don't we have the right um, to celebrate Pesach too, which would led to the creation of Pesach Sheni. Um, we're going to see a similar example with the daughters of Slavchad. So we see this actually even back in the time of the Torah, uh, coming all the way into the 17th century, of where we see first a priority towards the community, but then a certain elastic nature, right, uh, to, uh, to rules, to authority, that has to take into account and be responsive to individual rights. Um, in our final session next week, which I hope to see everybody at, we're going to take a step back, actually, from specific halachic uh, questions um, and take a look instead at some very large philosophical uh, questions. We're going to see uh, writings um, of Rabbi uh, Elijah ben Amozeg um, uh, from Livorno, Italy, uh, from a Moroccan family in the 19th century, who really talks about actually uh, Torah Shabiqtav and Torah Shabal Peh, the written and oral Torah, uh, actually as a way of addressing both levels of our existence as community members, but also as individuals. Uh, we'll look at one other writing as well that I think people will really enjoy. Again, getting into sort of the, the larger theological and philosophical about how to balance these issues. So thanks everybody so much for joining this evening and learning together. And I will look forward, Bezrat Hashem, uh, to our final session next week. Thank you.